right, so again, welcome to my presentation on my overview presentation on Mandoc called From Scratch to Standard BSD Documentation Toolkit in Six Years. Um, today, I'm covering five topics. I'm giving a short 10 minute intro about the why and how. Why do we do manuals? How does it work? Where does it come from? Then a main part um, about Mandoc from the user perspective. How does searching work and, and all that stuff. In particular, I'm focusing on the things that are new last year or this year. Um, there is a third part more technical about um, software engineering, how it was designed, how it was implemented, and system integration, how we got it into the operating systems. Um, a fourth part about the ugly things like code audits, bug fixing, web security. And finally, a conclusion, um, a summary of the status in the various BSDs and an outlook into the future. So, what is documentation all about? How does good documentation look like? Well, two things are completely obvious. The documentation needs to be correct and complete. Uh, unfortunately, even that is often violated. What is even more often... Can someone open the door, please? What is even more often forgotten is that documentation needs to be concise. It's not good when, when it's very long and you lose a lot of time reading it and have forgotten half of it when you arrive at the end. Um, what's also bad is if it's scattered all around, uh, part on the web, part on this directory, that format, uh, part in another directory, another format. To be helpful, it really needs to be all in one place, easy to find and easy to access. And, of course, it shouldn't be just plain text. It's better if the function of words is marked up, like this is a function name, this is a command line argument, this is a cross-reference, such that you can have it marked up in the display and can search for it. So, for the reader, it should be uniform in display and style. For the writer, it should be easy to set up, easy to edit, easy to maintain. Remember, without documentation, code is unusable because you don't know how to use it. So bad documentation is about as bad as bad code in the first place. It's even worse if it's hard to write. Developers won't write it, so you have nothing to read. The, the reader has one comprehensive tool now, the man program. And whenever you call man, it does which, whatever options, it does three things in sequence. It finds one or ma more manuals, either in a file system or in the database. It transparently calls a formatter on them and then displays the formatted text typically in a page. So far, that's quite usual and may seem trivial, but even in this easy area, there's been quite some progress last year and this year. We now have a, uh, a simple user interface, unified user interface, that, uh, where traditionally we had various programs, apropos for searching, man for steering, nref or mandoc for formatting, and all those had different options. Um, most importantly, since last year, we have semantic searching for pages in production in OpenBSD, now also in FreeBSD. And since this summer, we have semantic searching within a page. I will later show more details about that. And the same functionality is online in the MAN CGI, also based on this toolkit since last year. So now the author's perspective needs to be for the author needs to be easy to write, to diff, to read and change, should easily support a semantic markup, produce various output formats and be portable. And fortunately, there is one simple versatile language assuring all that, and that's the, the MDoc language, which has a long tradition. The basic syntax, the basic graph syntax, 
had its 50th anniversary last year because Jerry Saltze started it at MIT in 1964. And on that basic syntax, the classic MAN documentation language that was first used in AT&T V7 Unix was already based and then 10 years later, Cynthia Livingston on a Usenix grant invented the MDoc language for 4.4 BSD at Berkeley and she did a tremendous job. She implemented the language, she translated all the manuals for BSD to it, reading out all the AT&T proprietary content, rewriting from scratch what was needed. And nowadays that language is implemented uh, both in Mandoc and in Graph. And that MDoc language is used by default now in OpenBSD, NetBSD, FreeBSD, Dragonfly, and Illumos. And the main step forward with that language is that it has ex uh, considerable expressive power for semantic markup, while the older man language is a presentation level language only. So in mdoc you say this is a function name, this is a command line argument, while in man you say make this bold, make this italic, and so on. Besides, which is also important, is that the mdoc language is self-contained and complete. So if you write documentation in mdoc, you only need the mdoc macros. Whereas when you write documentation into the older man language, which in Linux where people still do if they write manuals at all, um, you always have to mix the high-level MAN macros with low-level raw formatting and it looks very, very confusing. Portability nowadays is no longer an issue because there are still a few very um, old-fashioned systems like um, commercial Solaris who still don't have the MDoc language in base, but when you distribute uh, portable software, you can just convert to MAN and distribute with, with the MAN tools and distribute both versions. So, to summarize the the ROF input syntax, the MDoc semantic markup, and the MAN presentation format are really three things that have proven timeless by their simplicity and efficiency. And nobody, many have tried, but nobody have come up yet with a better, better basic concepts. Those concepts that have been tried have mostly failed. For example, uh, Eric Raymond and RMS have agreed recently, last year or something like that, that they will retire the new info format and replace it by something else. <laughs> now, it's fine that we have a good formatting language, um, but of course if you have a language, you need, also need the toolbox to handle it. And that is now available in the Mandoc toolbox, which is functional in the way that it's all in one binary. It supports finding the manuals you want to read by file name, page name, word, substring, regular expression. It supports semantic searching by keys, both across and inside pages. It implements both traditional languages, um, also the table and EQN, Languages are almost fully supported and there is even some support for legacy content in low-level RAW. It supports ASCII, UTF-8, HTML-5, PostScript and PDF output. It allows MDoc to MAN conversions for portable software and it includes all the uti traditional utilities. It is completely free in the sense that it is ISC BSD licensed with no GPL code inside whatsoever. It's lightweight in the sense that it's ANSI C and POSIX and no C++ code inside whatsoever. Remember, graph is written in C++. It's portable, it's small, even though um, all the, this, this functionality is contained in one binary, the binary uh, which is not the case for graph, the binary is only half the size of graph, and it's fast. Graph is a very fast system for typesetting, 
But for MDOC manual formatting, um, MANDOC is about five times faster typically, while other toolkits like uh, uh, like ASCII doc docbook, which is about the worst that is available in almost any sense, is about 20 times slower than Graph for typical applications. Now, let's get to some fun stuff, searching for manuals. Uh, you certainly all now know the apropos command by Bill Joy, but he started in the very early days of BSD, where you say a keyword and then it searches the title lines of manual pages. Of course, in, in the MANDOC implemented MAN, all that functionality is retained with all its options, but you can do more now. You can search specifically for any of these, these things. For example, you can search for a word as a function name, or as the type of a function argument, or as a file system path, or as a variable name, or an error constant, or an author name, or whatever. And you can join that even with AND and OR queries, so you can ask things like, which POSIX mandated function returns, uh, uh, returns values of this or that type? Or um, what did uh, this or that old author write in section, which tools did he write for section 8? Stuff like that. Here I'm, uh, at the top I'm giving an example. I'm asking, um, which tools use the environment variable user? And then it gives me a list of matching manual pages. That's already available in uh, OpenBSD stable since last year and in FreeBSD current since this year. By default, if you search for multiple things at once, it will be ORed, optionally with a command line writing the command line in the wrong way, you can also use AND and parentheses. If you don't know all these macros quite well, you can also search for a keyword in any of the macros. The difference is the traditional apropos only search in the title lines. It is not a full text search, so you, what I'm doing now, you don't get uh, many false positives, but it searches across all the marked up content of the manual. And regular expressions are supported with just a minimal change in syntax. Now, we've gone one step further. We've integrated um, the manual viewer and the manual formatter into one single program. That has quite a list of advantages. The main advantage probably is that you only need to learn one user interface. They both now have the same options, so less to learn. And each one can now use the options that were traditionally only available in the other one. Like you can do an apropos search and you can tell it, oh, but please don't just give me the title lines such that I need to type man again. Give me the full pages right away. Or you can, the other way around, um, when you use the man command, you can say, and I want the output not as um, terminal output, as ASCII, I want the output as postscript, and you pipe it into GoSU right away on a single command line. So those are benefits. There are more. I'm not going through all of them. Um, all this functionality, in particular the complete search functionality, is now also available on the World Wide Web. So since about a year, the OpenBSD website has man cgi as a c program linked again the mandoc libraries and you can type exactly the same queries that you can type at the command line into the website so 
that's consistent. Of course, in HTML output, you get hyperlinks in addition to what you are used to. <clears throat> okay. Now, I'm getting to a very interesting part. This is now stuff that is really shown for the first time that also has never been shown in Canada before because it was completed basically two months ago. Um, imagine you are opening a huge man page. Let's actually do that. The terminal here, I type man k shell. Now what I actually want to do is how does the wait command in k shell work? So what you probably do in such a case, you type the slash for searching and then say wait. Oh, sorry. Thank you for telling me. Yeah. Better now. So, slash wait. Ah, false positive. Go on. Ah, false positive. Ah, false po Well, you, you see the pattern. So, let's try again. What I say now is use a tag, like as if you were using the CTAX program, wait, and it jumps right to the definition of the command. Now, um, that's what I call internal semantic searching. Um, however, this functionality is, a is linked to a lot of similar things. We have to, when designing and implementing that carefully, we have to think of it as a multi-dimensional ta task. Um, there are different kinds of linked targets that you might want to jump to, different kinds of linked sources where you get the, um, the link from, diff uh, two different linked distances, different jumping mechanisms, different output media. What is this all? Let's, let's go through it one by one. Link targets, the places where you might jump, want to jump to, obviously are se sections and subsections but also syntax element descriptions. You might want to jump to a, a, the definition, the description of a function name, a, an internal command, an environment variable, an error code, and so on and so forth. Or it could, the link targets could also be anchor specified by the document author. Of course, that should be used sparingly because the less you, the authors need to spec specify explicitly in the pages, the better. They, then they don't need to learn new syntax and type new syntax. But occasionally it might even be useful to specify a link target explicitly. Link sources could be explicitly set by the author, so the author could explicitly link from one place to, say, the definition of an environment variable. But better, they should be explicit. Whenever a syntax element is mentioned in the page, it should automatically generate a link to the definition of that element. Or it could just come from the reader's mind. The reader reads the text and thinks, okay, now I would like to know that, and just I've, as I've shown you, jump to another place. The link distance can be local in the same document, or remote to a different document, to a different manual page. The jumping mechanism can be search style, you just type in another name, or it could be hyperlink style, you have a marked up entity and you want to click on it. The output media could be terminal, HTML, PDF, whatever, and obviously on the terminal and in HTML and PDF such linking will work differently. So, for example, on a on the serial console of a server, we certainly don't want to be asked to do mouse clicking, and in a graphical browser, you probably don't want to type in link numbers to follow a link. So, uh, yet we do want all this to work consistently across all media. So it's crucial not to jump to an implementation and do it too quickly. When the first specific proposal was made, uh, what was proposed there would have doubled the number of macros in MDoc and required substantial rewriting of all manuals. And that's not the way we are going to go. So, what was done so far? Before I started, the state was that um, local explicit links were supported only and only to sections and subsections. 
and they were only working in HTML output mode and only in linking mode, not with any search functionality except, of course, searching for um, line start and the capital thing. What I did this summer is the, I designed a way to work with lists of local targets. So far that is and that is used for implicits only, uh, implicit targets only. So while the formatter is processing the manual page, it collects all the definitions of syntax elements like functions, keywords, flags, variables, errors, and builds a list what is where, and that list can then be used for, for jumping. Um, even though this is very partial functionality, I think it's an important step to have such a list at all, and it's a logical first step, and you have seen that it's already quite useful. How is this implemented? Um, first of all, it only does anything when you are using a pager and when at least one page is actually formatted. So when you are not using a pager, it's just using standard out, not doing anything at all, so it won't disturb your build systems. The first thing it does is set up two temporary files, one for the output, one for the tags, and one um, Mark SP style open hash table for collecting the information, and then during formatting, on the one hand, it counts the lines of output that must be done during formatting because we don't, know, we can't do it in the database because the user can specify different output widths, different terminal widths. And besides counting the lines, whenever it finds something interesting, it puts information into the hash table. In the third step, when formatting is complete, the text file is written to temp, then, in the fourth step, the pager is spawned, which is less, passing both files as arguments. Then it waits PIDs for the user to exit the pager and finally cleans up the temp files. The implementation adds 14 new lines to, to the formatter, to the existing code, and one additional module of 240 lines. So, um, it is not a lot of bloat technically, and it is also no user interface bloat because there is not a single new macro and no new syntax whatsoever. Quite small. Um, the plan for moving on with this is to carefully and slowly extend along the five dimensions. So it uh, should be rather simple to add more explicit targets and we could maybe also add some smart heuristics, more than we already have. We could explicitly support expl um, anchor definitions by the document author. The other points, the other dimensions are more complicated. For supporting more links uh, sources, we really carefully need to think about how to design explicit internal links to arbitrary targets because that will probably need a new macro. And while working for the last five or six years on all this stuff, I've been very glad to deprecate at least half a dozen legacy macros, but I've, I've never added one. I won't, don't want to make this more complicated, so I will carefully think about doing that, but I think at this place it will be warranted once. The jumping mechanism needs a careful design in particular for console hyperlinks. You're reading a manual on a console in a pager. Now what exactly do you do to jump to follow a link? That needs a careful design. And for, for the link distance we also need a careful design um, for the concept of uh, remote links. So if you say if in, in the page there is something like one library manual page is talking about a function that is documented into another, in another page. It should link to the definition of the, that function in that page and not just to the other page, but that will probably need um, an extension of the XR, the cross-reference macro, so that needs care. 
Um, yeah, and output media, of course. So far, even though HTML is easier with linking than terminal, I've only implemented this internal linking in, uh, in, on a terminal so far to get the difficult thing out of the way first. Needs to be done for HTML too, now that it's proven that it works on the console. Okay. Um, so far, about searching. But from the user perspective, searching is not the only thing that was improved during the last one and a half years. One thing that was improved was the representation of equations. Now, fortunately, in the base systems, there are very little uh, mathematical equations in manual pages, but there are areas where that is relevant. For example, in uh, X11 manuals, when it's coming to graphics, you have a lot of matrix manipulations. So there are some pages that do use it. Um, there never was a problem with parsing EQN code. That always worked quite well, but representing it is not a trivial problem. Christophs very nicely solved that last uh, autumn by using math, uh, by first moving all the HTML output to HTML5 and then using the MathML language for equation output. And I addressed the terminal, what GNU EQN does, is try to represent mathematical formula by moving up on the terminal stuff by a line or down a line or printing stuff on top of each other. And you can imagine that does, doesn't really work out. It's almost illegible. So what I've implemented instead is a linear representation of equations. So if you get, for example, a fraction it will just be printed like this, or if you get a matrix, it will just be printed like that. I admit, that's very far from nice, but at least it's intelligible, so you can grasp the content. That was about 125 lines of straight flat. Another thing that was improved in 2014 is multi-byte character support. So imagine you have a... Japanese or Russian manual written in, uh, in UTF-8. Um, what Graf does is it calls a preprocessor, transforming those UTF-8 characters into Graf escape codes and then feeds that into the formatter. What we have done in... Um, and you need to remember to add the, the option to the manual or the graph command line saying that this does contain UTF-8, otherwise it won't work because the preprocessor won't be called. So there are traps for the unvary. What we do now is um, we, we need absolutely no options, it just works because one thing I've integrated um, UTF-8 input handling into the Mandoc parser itself. UTF output works anyway for a very long time. And I've implemented automatic character set um, recognition in a very simple way. So if it looks like valid Unicode, it's formatted as Unicode, and otherwise it's formatted as Latin 1, uh, which works surprisingly well. So basically, reading Russian or um, Japanese manuals is no longer any more difficult than reading English ones. Suppose you speak Japanese, of course, that is. Yeah. Okay, let's perhaps... One other thing about the user um, experience is getting errors and warnings right. Until beginning of this year, it could happen that if a manual was severely misformatted and had really, really bad markup, you called the formatter on it, and the formatter would exit and say, this is so bad, I can't do anything with it. I can give you no output whatsoever. That's, uh, that's of course, bad, because it will annoy both authors and users, 
that can no longer happen since this January. I fixed the last cases that threw fatal errors. So whatever crap you throw into it, it will not now at least produce some output. Of course, um, garbage in, garbage out as always, but it won't give up. Um, I've spent surprisingly um, large amounts of time repeatedly at improving the quality of error and warning messages. The point is this. If an error message is missing or is too generic, then authors have a hard time finding the, the problems they introduce into, man, into manual pages. So you basically steal time from authors. Uh, think about tech um, error messages and stealing time from authors. If, uh, if a warning message is missing, authors write code and don't even realize that it's maybe not portable or is a bad idiom. On the other hand, if there are too many warnings or they were too prominent, people get annoyed at them and just switch them off. Um, some people think that you can get around this problem by adding a knob or two knobs to uh, select the level you want. But that's a bad idea too, because if you add too many knobs, you won't remember them and won't use them and you are back to square one. So, and by the way, all these problems in the beginning happened in Mandoc. We had too few and too many error messages all at the same time. Um, now we have settled at the system where we have exactly two user-relevant error levels. One means this is not good style, and one means this will probably, that's called a warning, and one means this will probably form it badly, that's called an error. Okay, one short remark in between, because we are talking about authoring man pages. In case you ever need to write or fix a manual and wonder how to do it, the most important resource that you should look at is the m.manual. If you wonder which sections information to put into, look at the manual structure section. If you wonder which macros to use for a specific purpose, look at the macro overview section. That's just 50 or 60 lines listing all the macros that exist in the logical order. If you have settled on using a specific macro and wonder how to do it, look at the macro reference section. Then, look at the OpenBSD base system for examples. Helps tremendously. And I just recently uh, walked over all the OpenBSD pages, 5,000 or so again, and I can confidently say that I they are all using everywhere a good and modern style. So anything you find in OpenBSD based system manual pages is good advice. Um, in FreeBSD, it's probably about half the pages that are good advice, and some have slightly um, old-fashioned syntax in some cases. Mandoc Tlint is very important. It catches most syntax errors and provides some hint on style. So once you have something, run it through Tlint. Yeah, and there are a few more resources. Of course, if nothing else helps, just mail to the discussion mailing list at mdocml bsdlv, which is the portable mandoc site. Okay, still, user perspective. Um, imagine you are maintaining a portable software package. Of course, with your software, you're providing complete and correct and concise and marked up documentation. However, you want it to be portable everywhere. So which language do you choose? In the past, that was a problem. You couldn't just use MDoc because then you were lost on systems like uh, commercial Solaris that simply didn't have that language. Now, just use the MDoc language. And before building your tarball and distributing it, run mandoc tman on your mdoc page, it will throw out a man version of the same page that will also work on commercial Solaris, package that together with the rest, 
and then let the configure script decide what to install on the target system. If mdoc is available, install mdoc. If man is available, install man. If nothing is available whatsoever, you can even let it install a formatted version. Of course, there is also the reverse program. Um, the guy who talked just before me, Vadim, is a great porter in OpenBSD working in, um, on foreign software, making it run here. So the, the slide before was about you write software, want it to run everywhere. Now you collect software from everywhere else, want to read the documentation. The problem with it is that Graph is the by far most used program for showing documentation and it has a lot of features and there is the law of feature creep. If some software offers a feature, sooner or later someone will use it. And as a porting corollary, even if a feature of the raw language is completely irrelevant and useless for manual pages, sooner or later you will find a third party software abusing it for manual pages. So, um, Mandor can never be a complete NROF implementation. Um, and so, in ports, you cannot say Mandoc or nothing because then some manuals will get misformatted, those that are re using the really arcane and useless features. Um, it's not that many any longer. So in the OpenBSD ports tree, 95% of ports manual just work with Mandoc. But what about the remaining 5%? The OpenBSD way to solve that problem, mostly devised by Mark Espy, who is doing a lot of work on our ports tree, is to mark those, those 200 that remain, that still need graph with a variable, we use graph, in the in the port make file, and then during the port's build, preformat the manual and package the formatted version. Otherwise, if the manual is fine with Mandoc, package the source such, such that the user can profit from semantic searching. The advantage, of course, is this works perfectly for all manuals. The inconvenience is that Porters need to pay attention and set that variable where it's needed, and it needs a bit of infrastructure, but we have that. Okay, so, so far about using Mandoc. Now I get to a bit of, um, of the design of the implementation and about system integration. So the question here is really um, how how was it done? How uh, was it that it became a success? The MDoc language, in a certain way, is a really nice language. It, has a, it was developed at almost the same time as HTML and has the same concept of a block structure. So, for example, you can have a, a block of optional syntax elements and it may contain sub that again are blocks and so on. Um, in Roth, all that is thrown away in the following way. When Graph starts formatting such a page, it translates the high-level structured requests into low-level physical formatting instructions and then outputs them on the respective output device. On the terminal, not much of a problem, but if you want to get, generate HTML, by the time you come to the formatter, you have all, lost already lost all the structural information, while Mandoc retains the structural information and is able to actually put classes into the HTML elements in HTML output. However, Roth is also an ancient language, so there are some gotchas. For example, uh, some manual pages use so-called badly nested blocks, which means that the author starts one block A starts another block B and then closes block A while block B that is inside is still open and uh, closes block the, the inner block only after the outer block. You can actually see here how such an example 
would look like when formatted. And that's actually how Graph formats it and how Malmberg formats it too. Our first thought was, oh, that's an abomination. We will deprecate it. Will people tell, tell people to stop doing that? But that didn't work out because there are quite a few manuals using that. And there is no way to change all manuals everywhere. Remember, we didn't want to have uh, Mandoc for OpenBSD only, or even to change the habits of all authors. So, reluctantly, we implemented that. It gets, gets even worse. While I told you that the MDoc language in principle is self-contained, and you can do everything you need in it, Still, there are some people who, um, who either mix in low-level ROF instructions, because they could in the past, and there are still legacy MAN manuals, and they have low-level ROF instructions mixed in the first place. So, some low-level ROF had to be implemented, but we did that later. That approach actually turned out to be right. Starting from the high level gave us a clean design, and then the reluctance to do the unclean, low-level stuff kept us from getting off track. Um, in the beginning, the structure of, Man of the Mandoc program was basically have a main loop for iterating over all the files, and then for each line of each file, look which macros are in that line, push them into the parser, which converts it into a syntax tree, and when the syntax tree is ready, pa pass the syntax tree to a formatter who will iterate the syntax tree and generate some output. Yes? How can you represent such badly nested blocks in a tree? Do you uh, generate over, do you, um, over the length of the so the question is, how do we actually represent um, badly nested blocks? What we actually do is, physically, the whole B block is contained inside the whole A block. And after this BO, we insert an additional element that says the formatting of the A block stops here, but not the block itself. It's a te technicality, but that's how it's done. Yeah, so, um, how, how did we get in a bit of low-level rough support? Well, after the f um, before the first step of parsing each line of input for macros, we inserted a call to a, a ROF preprocessor, um, interpreting the low-level ROF stuff, doing something with it, taking it out, and then passing what remained on to our normal um, parsers and formatters. Now, that might seem strange, because it's uh, putting all the concept of the language topsy-turvy. What Roth does is expanding high-level macros into low-level requests and then formatting them. And what we do is first get rid of all the low-level requests such that only the high-level stuff remains and then formatting that. And at first you would think that can't work at all. It's starting from the wrong side. However, it does. And the reason why it does, I think, is that what is essential about manuals is the high-level structure. So that there is some low-level stuff mixed in is just a smaller side effect. So actually our way is, is ju at least just as logical as the other way. Of course, this concept won't work at all in general typesetting because there it's completely different. There the low-level stuff is not just a side effect. So... Sometimes it's possible to put a concept really all the other way around, but only sometimes, not always. By 2011, we had reached the stage where we could say, okay, it just works, and where we enabled it in OpenBSD, basically after one year of working on it. And then we said, okay, now 
you are the systems, if you want it, if you think this is viable, just grab it. You can do the same as we did, only with less risk and with more support. And basically that's what happened. NetBSD integrated it one year later, FreeBSD finished the integration, almost finished the integration last year, this year. Yeah. Um, so, one of the f most important factors for success was that we moved fast. We didn't let our staff use a rod in some corner, but as soon as we were confident that it could maybe be usable, we put it in, we switched it on, we kept moving fast, we didn't fear change, and uh, when something broke, we quickly fixed it. Um, of course, if you, think, if you put in stuff into production that's just finished, then sometimes things will break. You will have forgotten something. In that case, what we did is quickly implement a fix, the quickest fix that was available, put it in. People were content again, could read their manuals. And then we started thinking, okay, how should we solve this? Took a few weeks or even a few months in some cases, devised a proper solution, ripped out the quick hack, put in the proper solution, and we're glad with that. We did that at least five times, a list of examples here. Now you might think, oh, well, that is inefficient. You code everything twice. But no, it's actually a very sane and efficient way. The first implementation explores the feature. What is, is it exactly what we need to do? And the second implementation then gets it right. And that's particularly a good approach in complicated cases. And those that go, go wrong in the first place typically are complicated cases. So that's not a bad way to, to go on. Um, so a summary of that is, we started coding with a nice high-level stuff that gave us a very clean overall design. We etched in some low-level ugliness later, but just where it was required, not everywhere we, where we could do it, even while the tool was already in production. And that changing parts of the design after the fact was only possible since we kept everything small and simple. Otherwise, when you build a gigantic framework with lots of layers, such stunts would break everything if you try to change the design after the fact. So it's well known that, that complexity should be shunned for two reasons, because complexity is uh, adverse for correctness and for security. But actually, there is a third reason why simplicity is so important. It's also important for flexibility and that in turn is important for being able to, to get on, to move on, to move fast and to get new stuff into production. So that was probably the most technical part about the um, system integration. Now what happened last year is that this very dangerous predator approached our code. Um, Jonathan Gray, one OpenBSD developer, helped him and uh, weeded out lots of bugs from, um, from Mandoc. So, uh, of course, I should say a, f a fuzzer is a program that feeds another program crap in the hope to crash it and to uncover bugs, in particular security bugs. Jonathan Gray with the American Fuzzy Lab program found 45 issues grand total. That's enough for allowing a quantitative but not a statistical analysis. A third of these bugs were violations of invariant. A third were due to excessive complexity, partly in the languages, partly in implementation. And the rest were standard things like missing input validation, buffer overflows, use of the free. So there were a few lessons from that. Obviously, the most important, uh, keep code small and uh, simple. Simple because uh, quite a bit of this was due to ex 
uh, excessive complexity, and but then also um, paying attention to the to the simplest sources of bugs, like input validation, buffer overflows, use after freeze in in such a real world setting, may get rid of already with relatively easy auditing about a third of the potential vulnerabilities. And also a lesson is that OpenBSD is certainly not a project that is famous for sloppy programming. And Chris Depps is certainly not a programmer who is incompetent. So even when people who are moderately skilled programmers in, a, in an environment that is doing a lot for security, try to code up something, then you still get considerable numbers of bugs. So auditing and re-auditing is really important. Um, slightly later, Sebastien Marie audited the web manual viewer that I've told you about. And at first I thought, oh well, what's the point? It doesn't even have authentication. And come on, what is the risk here? People reading manual pages who shouldn't? What's the point? Well, no. The point, the point is different. It was running on Bob's server. And if it's doing things it shouldn't, it may burn resources. Uh, it may reveal information from the server that was never intended to be revealed. And the, uh, Sebastian found various things there. For example, missing input validation leading to sec faults or unvalidated input, like from path info as query string, leading to information disclosure being able to re read um, arbitrary files or invalid characters in, in the input from the user that would lead to XSS vulnerabilities. Um, so the, the lesson from that was whatever web application you are writing you should always consider it security critical, even if it doesn't do any authentication and even if it doesn't contain anything but public information. It's really worth looking at. Performance. I'm mostly mentioning that to de-emphasize it. Yes, there are situations where you have to look into performance. For example, my first approach to get all this into the OpenBSD build system remained, uh, resulted in making the build times longer on slow architectures. And that met opposition because developers said we don't want to hinder developers developing, we want to help developers developing, so it needed to be optimized. However, um, only start optimizing at the very end and only if you really need it. it, it um, most people start much too early and spend much too much time on it. And uh, here we have a, a, a typical example of a thing that should not be optimized. With the old plain text apropos, a typical search took about 10 milliseconds on my notebook. Now, the new SQLite based approach has some more overhead and takes four times the time. That sounds bad, but it's 40 milliseconds, so not going to optimize a great lot there. Good. We are coming to the conclusions. What made this replacement project proceed, uh, succeed? First, we started with a clean design and we sparingly added support for less clean, historically grown features that were needed. We quickly went into production and then paid great attention to uh, user feedbacks to find and fix bugs and to add the real world functionality actually needed. We improved step by step 
aiming for complete functionality but avoiding bloat and step by step implementing the real world needs. The priorities were first correctness and security, second compatibility, third simplicity and fourth performance but in that order. The status summary, so where is this used now? It's fully integrated in three operating systems. So all the features available are used in OpenBSD, Alpine Linux, and Void Linux. It's almost fully integrated in FreeBSD current, mostly due to the work of Baptiste Daroussin. The only reason that the MAN program is not switched yet in FreeBSD current is that, and that's healthy. He doesn't want to change too many things at the same time. He wants to move in well-defined steps such that people don't get screwed. It's the default formatter in NetBSD and Illumos, but they don't have this powerful search applications yet. It's in the base system, but not used by default in Dragonfly and FreeBSD 10 and Linux. It's in official packages for FreeBSD 9, Arch Linux, and PKG source. And there are unofficial things for, for many other systems. Um, the commercial Linuxes um, have typically outdated packages, probably easy to update, but don't really use it yet. But Systems like Alpine Linux have demonstrated for years that it's possible in Linux to completely rely on it and get rid of all the old stuff. Possible future directions. Work is on, in progress on a lot of topics. We are converting the LibreSSL manuals to, to MDoc with Christab's pop to MDoc tool that is related to this project but not part of it. I'm working on unifying the parses, aiming for yet better RAW support to get possibly rid of those 200 last use graph ports. We also can work on, we also work on uh, improving automatic detection of unsupported source code. That's what FreeBSD uses in the ports tree. We can delete, if we want to, most hard links to manual pages because uh, Mandoc is now doing that in a more efficient way in the database. Chris Dubs is working on a converter of tech info documents to MDoc that can both be used for just converting the stuff once and then checking in the MDoc pages or alternatively to do it on demand. But that's in an early stage. Um, for a long time, I wanted to get more helpful with MAN to MDoc conversions. That would be useful for getting legacy manuals to the newer format. Um, so far, the best thing that exists is going via Christop's DocBook to MDoc tools. So you would first convert to app to DocBook, not, not because you ever want to use that for anything. It's the worst software and available in documentation, but because it can be used as a transition format. And, of course, I want to uh, continue work on the internal search and deep linking that I focus on today. What is not yet started and which, which would be a, a particularly cool thing would be to support automatic semantic enrichment of Perl manuals, so of manuals written in the pod language, such that you could, in the same way as you can search for functions in base system manuals, also search in Perl manuals. Right now, the pod language is translated to MAN, and then you get no semantic search support, but I haven't even started on that yet. Okay, on the minute. So, I'd like to thank a few people. Of course, foremost, Cynthia Livingston, who implemented the MDoc language in the first place and translated the bulk of our manuals that we are all using in all BSDs. Dan Christops Johnsons for writing MANDOC. Jörg Sonnenberger, who is actually here, I've seen him, for contributing important code 
um, in, in particular in the early phases, Mark Espy for doing the OpenBSD ports integration and lots and lots of important f uh, feedback, also for the OHash library we are using. Jonathan Gray for all that AFL testing, Sebastian Marie for the same thing with MAN CGI, and then a lot of OpenBSD developers who helped, in particular Jason McIntyre, our main manual maintainer, and lots and lots of other people. By the way, all these slides are up on the web from all my talks, uh, so if you go to the, to the OpenBSD MAN page, uh, home page, then here in the bottom right besides open SSH and Libre SSL, you have a link. Oh, it's again off screen. Thank you for noticing. Um, now you see it? Yes, here right besides open SSH and Libre SSL, you have a link to the Mandoc home page. And here you have a, a press and media coverage page where all the talks are available. Um, yeah, and then there were several people who contributed source code patches from various systems, Franco Fichtner, Dragonfly, Christos Zulas, NetBSD, and so on and so on, and lots and lots of people who have reported bugs and suggested useful features, yeah. So much. What would you like to ask? Especially the extended search features were very nice. What would be required to take a previous system and import that and replace the existing or looking at an attempt on something? So the question is what would be required to replace man in FreeBSD and make available all those nice um, search features? The answer is to use all those nice search features, install FreeBSD current. Um, Batista Roussin did it, it's available. He also is able to integrate MAN, it needs very little, basically switching a few things in, in make files and configuration files. The only thing he doesn't do it just yet is, as I said, to not... Um, to not alienate people by switching too many things at the same time. If you want to do it manually to use the MAN, it's probably sufficient to just move the existing MAN shell script aside, rename it, and then make a hard link from the existing MAN binary to MAN. That should be sufficient to make it work. If you type man after, I didn't try, but I wouldn't know what else to do. And then you can create, if you want to, a etc man conf file in the right format if you need any configuration, like adding another directory. Yep. There is another question. Yes, that was a comment. Mandoc has been the default formatter for FreeBSD since last November. That agrees with what I... Yeah, you get Mandoc out of the box on FreeBSD current as, as the default formatter, not yet as the default viewer, but that is not as important for the user as the searching, yeah. Yeah, Michael? Mm -hmm. For those who caught out Ender's talk on PCC, one of the many, many, many motivations for Mandoc was to resolve the problem of the fact that drop was based on C++. So that if PCC was in base, you would not be tackling drop. Yeah. So Michael says that one of the main motivations for graph was to get rid of the C++ dependency for graph, which, which is true. There were, were a few more motivations. For example, reducing build times, base system build times was another motivation because before Mandoc arrived in OpenBSD, we had to format all the manuals during the build with graph. Now we just, we don't format them at all, not even with Mandoc, but just install the sources. Yeah. 
it's right, I didn't mention all the motivations. I'm more focused on uh, user features, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Otherwise, thanks a lot for, for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. And have fun in the final session and a good way home. Oh, thank you. I like that.